Welcome everyone to yet another uh, installment in our Fall Creative Outlook Gaming Birthday Extravaganza series. Uh, today we're going to be talking about The Legend of Zelda, and as I like to do in these intros, uh, if there is much, obviously I couldn't do much uh, for the, uh, <laughs> the Sonic episode, uh, we do have plenty of news we can go through, that's kind of the point of these intros here, is of course not only to, of course, introduce the episode, uh, but to go over some uh, topics that have potential, or some news that has uh, come out about the series, whether it's just fun little things or actual big announcements uh, between my original recording of the episode back earlier this summer or the, uh, and now that I am uh, doing the intro, of course, as you can tell, I still have my uh, Rextro shirt on if you're uh, watching the video. Audio listeners don't get to quite see that, kind of like how they didn't get to see the uh, little studio tour uh, from before uh, in the last episode. I always recommend maybe if you want to dabble in a little bit of both versions, you get to see some fun things in the video, or maybe you just enjoy audio. There's, there's always perks to both, uh, but I uh, slightly digress there. Um, so today, uh, like I said, we're going to be talking about The Legend of Zelda. So I just wanted to bring you some fun little uh, stories courtesy of uh, uh, good old NintendoLife.com since they're, uh, we're talking about a, a Nintendo-related uh, topic here. I thought I would pull up some articles that might be fun uh, that contribute to uh, some of the topics that we're talking about uh, in this episode. So perhaps uh, the most recent piece and talking about one of the most famous games of all time, widely considered by many to be uh, the greatest video game of all time, though I don't know if it's quite considered in that same light uh, anymore today, nor many more today, is uh, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time for the Nintendo 64. It is a game that we uh, or that I uh, talk about in this episode. Um, and if you've ever played... Uh, Super Smash Brothers for Wii U, or uh, in this case, Super Smash Brothers Brawl, uh, you might be familiar with the in-game masterpieces. So these are uh, essentially demos of games that the characters in Smash Brothers come from. They were not included in, well, they were first introduced in Brawl, and they were not included in Smash for 3DS or uh, Super Smash Brothers Ultimate, just uh, Brawl and Smash for Wii U. Um, and one of the demos included in Super Smash Bros. Brawl was for The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Uh, and if you know anything about Nintendo 64 games, it's that, generally speaking, this isn't true for every game, but oftentimes Nintendo developed games would receive uh, release in Japan first, and then it would release to the rest of the world. And that just kind of makes sense. Uh, you know, they were getting into text-heavier games, even something like Super Mario 64, which isn't super text-heavy, uh, still came out in Japan first just because... Well, it was written there. It, it didn't have to go through any extra localization. And uh, so these were oftentimes the very first versions of uh, these games, right? And the same holds true for The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Uh, you would see updated uh, releases with bug fixes when it would be released in North America and Europe and, and, and the like, right? And... In Super Smash Bros. Brawl, uh, the Ocarina of Time masterpiece in the Japanese version is that original Japanese release, or at least one of the first uh, Japanese releases. And so a speedrunner apparently has managed to beat The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time in Brawl, uh, which sounds like, well, that doesn't sound super impressive until you consider that, you know, this is a timed, like, four-minute demo. And... Mm, I don't know, in the speedrunning community, it's considered beaten because uh, this is just an any percent, uh, this runner uh, named uh, as Save State, what an appropriate name for a speedrunner, uh, beat the Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time in 4 minutes and 38 seconds, and being beating the game is just considered getting uh, to the credits, which would mean he had 12 seconds to view the credits, which is crazy, so... Um, Essentially, what he what what happened, and this comes, um, I believe it's a statement from him, is you know this Ocarina of Time version is the okay, excuse me, it's a five minute demo, so it five minutes to get to the credits, uh, time to do this, and it included a couple of save files, one that was um, started in Child Link's life, and then one for Adult Link. So essentially, what he did is he chose uh, the adult file and just did some of the fancy schmancy glitches you have to do to beat the game. 
And lo and behold, apparently it appears you can beat The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, the Japanese version, in less than five minutes, even in Super Smash Bros. Brawl, which is pretty darn impressive, I must say. And I just, I think it's, you know, I, I, I like, I, I, I think I said this in the Sonic episode. I like my games fast, but I'm, I have no, no talent for speedrunning. So I think it's very impressive to uh, see someone be able to do this and beat a game inside of another game even though I wouldn't exactly call it really beaten, but, you know, I, I'm not a speedrunner. I'm not part of the speedrunning community. They're certainly welcome to uh, uh, define things how they choose to. Similarly, the uh, Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time has been in the news because some folks have been working on uh, decompiling the game. So this is like reverse engineering, uh, finding stuff in it to, for example, put it on other platforms. In fact, this uh, uh, the article that I will have linked here by Damian McFerrin mentions that uh, Super Mario 64 was, because it was reverse engineered and decompiled, that it was ported to systems like the Dreamcast and the PS2. So I'd assume the team is going for a similar thing here with uh, Ocarina of Time. Um, but uh, the, the, the big reason that you'd want to see this ported, of course, is to bring it to PCs, right? Now, I just have my potato of a laptop here that probably wouldn't be able to play anything all that impressive, but we've seen some super impressive um, modifications to Super Mario 64 thanks to uh, the efforts of uh, this decompiling here, right? There now, um, there's now a widescreen version of Super Mario 64. There's ray tracing. There's um, completely brand new models, again, with similar mods that you would see on PC. And, you know, this this is just another classic example. I'm going to be talking about this more with some of these other little articles I have um, uh, included here in talking about Zelda of folks or of fans taking the initiative to do things that the developers just for whatever reason won't. And I think that's a pretty clear, uh, important service that, you know, fans uh, in, uh, uh, take care of to uh, assist to keep the community alive around the game, even when it is, in the case of Ocarina of Time, what is it, 23 years old, 1998, if I'm uh, uh, remembering correctly. Uh, similarly, you can see things like finding uh, old uh Elements that didn't get included in a game, like there's a player who found, well, there's originally supposed to be some uh, poison water as an element in The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. It didn't end up getting used, uh, though it has been known about for three years at this point, 2018, uh, according to the uh, article that I'm reading here about this. But um, some folks are trying to actually... Uh, put this back in the game. Now, could it show up in the sequel to the Legend of Zelda? Yeah, to the sequel to the Legend of Zelda: Breath of the Wild, possibly. I don't know yet. Um, but again, just another example of fans doing a service to keep the community around the Legend of Zelda: Breath of the Wild going. Although I, even with the sequel to the game, I do not foresee it uh, <laughs> stalling anytime soon. Uh, do I have any other Breath of the Wild focused things here? Oh yeah, someone made a. Uh, a map of Breath of the Wild in uh, uh, Google Maps on the street view, so you can actually just walk around Hyrule in first person. Uh, I just, I love these sorts of little stories, especially when, you know, as, like as much as I uh, value things like the mods, it's, I, I could, there are definitely some legal gray areas in that that are uh, uh, questionable, although as far as ethical gray area, or as, as far as the ethics are concerned, with doing something like creating a mod for Ocarina of Time or Breath of the Wild, I mean, come on, Nintendo, it's just a modification that's pretty standard on PC. I totally understand why people want to mod games. Hex, you know, you have, I love fan translations, and that is a clear uh, classic example of a mod for games that just I can't play in English that I want to play in English. So I think they need to need to curb their uh, use of that, although I think there are some uh, exceptions with something like I talked about last year's uh, little Super Smash Brothers Melee Slippy debacle and how silly I thought that was. I think that, you know, that like I said, there can be exceptions to everything. I just, I want to be consistent here. Generally, I like mods, and I think it would have been, would, I think the Slippy mod is genius for um, people just wanting to play Super Smash Brothers Melee online, but I totally understand Nintendo's apprehension to having a tournament using that. Uh, I would not, you know, if, if I owned Smash Brothers, I probably would not want something like that either, even if I do think it's, you know, ethically okay, just for personal use. Uh, of course, uh, over the summer we had the uh, release of 
uh, The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword HD. I still haven't picked it up yet. I've thought about it a couple of times. Uh, I do have the Zelda and Loftwing amiibo that was embroiled in a bunch of controversy because it uh, allows you to fast travel between Skyloft and the, 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 uh, man, there's a particular term for it in the game, and I'm just going to call it the ground, <laughs> whatever the land of Hyrule is called at this point, uh, in Skyward Sword, but, uh, I, I just wanted it because, like I said, I'm just, I'm going for a, a complete collection of the things that I care about, and Zelda is, uh, certainly one of those series that I, uh, would like to have of me before. After all, it's, I care about Zelda. That's kind of why I'm doing this whole episode here, right? Um, but it seems that some folks, particularly in uh, the uh, Dutch territories, are having some issues uh, playing the game. Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure if this is a glitch or what exactly the issue is, but it seems that there's no ending cinematic in the Dutch version of The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword, it just goes to a frozen white screen, uh, which is very, very uh, strange, because apparently if you change the game to English, then you can see the final cinematic and see like the credits after beating the final boss of the game, Demise. Uh... <laughs> So I'm not exactly sure what uh, the team, I'm not sure if this was a Grezzo port uh, like Metopia was, or a, or, well actually they also did Link's Awakening on Switch as well. I'm not sure what the issue apparently is for the Dutch version, but that's something that I would love to see addressed in this, uh, in a patch at some point. But that's just very strange that it's seemingly only affecting one particular language. I'm wondering if there is a glitch with loading the text and the cutscene, but it's pretty upsetting that it comes down to the last version, or the last cutscene of the game, that everything else seems to have been uh, localized. Uh, as far as other stories, again, another... Uh, 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 I, I, I think it's interesting to see something like this real world. Uh, the Olympics was a few weeks... Actually, it's probably a month ago at this point that the Olympics was, because I'm I'm just, like I said, I'm doing these all on September 5th, these uh, ones that you're seeing in the Rextro's arcade shirt. Um, and uh, one of the uh, gold medalists for the uneven bars, Nina Derweil from Belgium. I'm sorry if I pronounced her name incorrectly. Uh, but apparently she's had a good luck charm of a Link figure from uh, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, uh, which... Some people have pointed out that the figure appears to be the Ocarina of Time uh, Link amiibo figure just popped off of its uh, base. I don't actually know if that's the case, but it it looks too uncannily similar to not be that. So <laughs> I just I think it's kind of funny that that uh, <laughs> that 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 is a, a good luck charm for her and. You know, congratulations to uh, Nina for winning the gold in the uneven bars. Uh, at this point right now, we're more focused on the Paralympics, um, and I'm sure there are exciting things happening there. I'm not really not much of a sports guy, so I haven't read about anything that's happening in the Paralympics, or, and I hardly read about anything happening in the Olympics. That just happened to be a nice intersection of the real world and the legend of zelda that i thought would be interesting to report on today so that was just a nice little nice little zelda focused roundup of news for this intro uh, this should be the the gold standard for other intros the uh sonic one was a little bit of an outlier because like i said there hasn't been much happening uh but uh, that should cover what I wanted to say here today. So why don't I introduce uh, the topics that we're going to be talking about in this Zelda episode. So of course we're going to have our uh, typical, like I said, this is the, uh, a standard episode. We're going to be talking about an overview of the series. We're going to hear about the futures. Though again, this is just a nice little, a little short uh, future talk. Uh, and I thought, you know, uh, a lot of these special topics, I'm I'm focusing on just a, a special question that I thought could be interesting. Uh, so I wanted to ask today, what could make the Legend of Zelda CDI games actually be, you know, good and fun and <laughs> enjoyable to play? Uh, because suffice it to say, they're not exactly considered to be very strong games in the uh, Zelda series. They're not even on the official Zelda timeline, and 
What a shocker that is, I'm sure. <laughs> so uh, with that all said, I'm just going to send you folks back in time to uh, whenever I uh, recorded the original uh, Zelda, rest of the Zelda bits for this episode. So uh, as always, please enjoy uh, what you're going to listen to here today. It was, a, it's, it was a pleasure putting it on then, and it's a pleasure recording this now. Thank you. 